portrays a uh, whole position, a uh, unfalsifiable narrative. His his ideas are falsifiable. <laughs> portrays a uh, whole position, a uh, unfalsifiable narrative. His his ideas are falsifiable. <laughs> Tell me how it's falsifiable, or tell me what would falsify it. He never actually gave me an answer to that. We actually don't know the real speciation events, and we've actually made testable predictions based on this model that we... Of course, the gold standard of, of science is making these testable and, and falsifiable predictions, and we've made it on mutation rates. We've made it on, you know, DNA function, so... The, you know, many testable and falsifiable predictions that we've uh, made. For example, the tree that, that I always show that Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has derived based on mitochondrial DNA that points right back to Noah's three daughters-in-law makes testable predictions on the stamp of uh, civilizations. For one, the mountains that I'm talking about that are formed from the uplifting and the collisions of the plates as a result of this, we've made a prediction. So we predicted that the, co the cold ocean crust, if our model is true, it should still be cold. Rock layers have ripple marks, meaning there was a global flood in the past and the flood sorted animals by ecosystems. Like I said, sea creatures first, then land creatures, as you would expect in the flood. That's exactly what we see. And I've got a testable falsifiable prediction that has been confirmed Seismic data, actually, uh, and you can look this up to yourself. I can provide the paper from NASA. It's actually revealed enormous slabs of cool rock that are under North America. So down in the core itself, what I'm saying, which should be warm, it's actually confirmation of flood geology. The statements that I just told you about the global flood being falsifiable in regards to the catastrophic plate tectonics model, if you want me to go into it again, We've seen rapid magnetic reversals, also confirmation of the floods. His evidence, at least his primary evidence, was for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> I've already shown you that my explanations are not based on God did it. Beginning of the debate, he talks about how it's evolutionism, trying to make it out to be something that it's not. That really bothered me the entire debate. <laughs> as well as him thinking that evolution says anything about origins or anything like that. Abiogenesis and even Big Bang territory. And I feel like that's pretty disingenuous too. Abiogenesis? I didn't mention anything about abiogenesis. Although chemical evolution is obviously needed to be explained if you're going to have a coherent theory of biological evolution. But that's why I actually asked him in the beginning of the discussion period, what is your definition of biological evolution? And we both agreed that biological evolution means a change in allele frequency or a change in gene pool over generations, in populations, of course. And we agreed on that. I heard you say that, you know, evolution for the most part, at least biological evolution would mean, you know, a change in allele frequency or, or gene frequency in populations over generations. Um, would you agree with, with that as, as a valid definition for biological evolution? Well, yeah, I, I, th I think that's, that's uh, you know, specific enough, I guess. I brought up in the debate was the idea that two people could have produced an entire population uh, of, of, uh, of a species. And um, I find that to be very interesting because that's not actually what genetics shows, genetics shows us. Uh, genetics actually shows us that if there are only two of a certain species, that is actually not enough genetic di diversity in order to get an entire population of a single species. <laughs> He claims that genetic similarities in human DNA uh, actually points to Adam and Eve, and this is actually not true at all. <laughs>
when we look at mitochondrial Eve, the data says that mitochondrial Eve is very literally the mother of us all. And Gallus Engineer here seems to misunderstand what I'm saying in regards to the argument because 99% of the opening, my opening statement, as usual in my debates, was not addressed. And the small number of mutations that separate modern people from this sequence of mitochondrial Eve clearly and, and evidently indicates and suggests that mitochondrial Eve lived in, in the recent past. And there just has not been enough time. That's why the evolutionary rebuttals to this, where they say, oh, you know, mitochondrial Eve lived hundreds of thousands of years ago. The creationists, they're misusing the data. No, no, no. No, godless engineer. There has not been enough time for very many new mutations to have accumulated on this chromosome. And based upon the actual empirically observed mutation rate for this human chromosome, studies clearly indicate and suggest this mitochondrial Eve had to have lived recently, just thousands of years ago. And of course, evolutionary scientists, they've done similar analyses, but instead of just using the actually observed mutation rate, they have been compelled to use hypothetical mutation rates that are about 20-fold lower than what is actually observed. And of course, they have justifications for this because they're, they're looking at certain evolutionary assumptions. And the biggest, the most fundamental assumption that they actually make is that molecules to man, fish to fisherman type evolution, bacteria to biologist evolution is an absolute fact. And so all data must be force-fitted. That's why rescue device after rescue device is invented because this data has to be force fitted to support the paradigm. And that's why they calculate mitochondrial Eve the way that they do. And this is the same that, that goes with Y chromosome atom. I mean, there's just no, there's just no way to, to refute it. So similar DNA uh, would not point to that. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting when the human genome project mapped the human genome, they said there's only one race of people. You know what that confirms? The Bible. Because we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all one race. Uh, so I don't think it confirms the Bible. It just makes the Bible consistent with nature on this one point. Once again, I don't think Godless Engineer here quite understood what I meant about low genetic diversity in human beings. I mean, I think it's only about 0.5% different max difference between any two human beings pointing us right back to the fact that we only came from two people, Adam and Eve. And we are seeing the rise and fall of, of, of the so-called near extinction event, the rescue device. They wouldn't come up with this bottleneck, population bottleneck rescue device if there wasn't some absolute truth to this. And we are witnessing, we're seeing firsthand the demise, the death of this key evolutionary paradigm belief that, you know, there was supposedly a prolonged evolutionary bottleneck concurrent with the evolution of modern humans. Of course, over deep time and God, this engineer here loves, spent half the debate appealing to deep time. You know, if I were to tell you that Mary Poppins could fly slowly through the air with her umbrella, you'd say standing for truth. You're crazy. That's a fairy tale. And you'd be right. But if I said Mary Poppins could fly quickly through the air with her umbrella, you'd, well, according to Godless Engineer, you'd say, yeah, that's more believable. That's scientific. No, they're both fairy tales. And over this, this deep time, according to evolutionary theory, any, any large, significantly large population will undoubtedly accumulate enormous numbers of mutations resulting in enormous amounts of genetic diversity. And this is a serious, this is a major fatal blow problem for evolutionary theory because we can now, we, we can now see that it is absolutely clear that mankind is genetically very similar. We have very limited genetic variation. And this is obviously expected given the biblical model, as I've shown in my opening presentation, because we all come from just two people. So limited diversity obviously is easy to explain. But from this evolutionary perspective that God, this engineer wants us to believe in so badly, this limited human genetic diversity, according to them, it requires absolutely, it's a rescue device, this near extinction event that supposedly came before modern man's abrupt 
emergence and, and appearance and, and, you know, this supposed conquest of the planet. But at the end of the day, this explanation of, of a population bottleneck, this near extinction event, all it is, is is a rescue device. And it's pseudoscience because it's so easily debunked. Because if you actually look at this near extinction event, this genetically compromised population that actually explodes into different parts of of the planet and and apparently you know seizes dominion over the world because yes it can conceivably you know have maybe reduced overall human diversity but the thing is it is just a post hoc embellishment of this evolutionary theory because it actually is incredible and the reason why is because small very minute bottleneck populations they have extreme extremely significant problems and this is the exact rebuttal that i'd bring up if if these evolutionists actually came prepared and and tried to rebut my claims about low genetic diversity and all this evidence for y chromosome atom mitochondrial eve three major haplogroups I and mean, everything just fits perfectly in a biblical model but if there's let's say this genetic diversity and and this this rescue device here it's going to require and involve an extended near extinction event and it's gonna be associated with severe significant inbreeding and that's why it's not even remotely feasible because from the evolutionary perspective human genetic homogeneity it it remains a very serious theoretical and hypothetical problem because according to the biblical perspective there's no problem at all because of course there were no mutation there was no genetic load there was no genetic buildup with adam and eve and then immediate post-creation but with the biblical perspective, the bottlenecks that we see in scripture, they were both brief. There wouldn't have been any any issue. There would have been very little genes lost, even according to the pre-existing heterozygosity hypothesis. But the reason why this very lim- limited human genetic diversity is, is a huge problem for evolutionary theory, because it does lead to unrestrained storytelling. And, and that's what evolution is all about. It's all about storytelling. And this this limited human genetic diversity is very obviously compatible with the biblical perspective. It doesn't require all this far-fetched inventions and storytelling that evolutionists talk about. Um, so we know this because of fossil evidence that we found. We've found fossils in the past uh, that connect dogs to a proto-dog-like animal, and you can trace all of those all the way back. doing was he kept talking about de-evolution, which is kind of a made-up word. There is no de-evolution. I don't know what his concept of de-evolution is. I don't know how, like, Adam and Eve were such superior versions of humanity that now we're a diluted mess or something, or or we're de-evolving from that higher state. I don't, not going to try to figure out what the fuck he was talking about. Um, there's a lot of other things like lactose tolerancy, uh, our ability to drink milk and milk products. That was a mutation. <laughs> anyway. 
He also claimed that evolution is self-limiting, and I really don't see the self-limiting nature of evolution, because evolution is just a change in a population over time that eventually uh, ends up with different species depending on how those changes affect the organisms in that population. So I don't see how this is self-limiting. Um, I, I only see it limiting when, you know, bad mutations crop up, and uh, those are not as prevalent as he would like to make them out to be. Now, genomic degradation, genetic entropy, genetic entropy, there is plenty of empirical data for that. Of course, this is going off of like really bad science, uh, pseudoscience, uh, to which the actual proponent of the genetic entropy and, and all of that, he doesn't actually find any data in real world observations to support his genetic entropy. Dr. John Sanford did not admit that there's no evidence for Genetic entropy. Genetic entropy in real time, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, autism, asthma, autoimmune, cancers, immunological diseases. There is a pandemic. A lot of it could also be epigenetic mutation. This all means that we are seeing entropic degeneration on all levels. And you can even increase selection intensity, but the problem won't stop can't be stopped. We are a dying people in a dying world. I was trying to explain to him that the mutation rate, the accepted mutation rate is 100 new mutations per person, per generation. That, that means that if there's 7 billion people on the planet, and the fact that most mutations are in the non-selection zone, that's 700 billion new mutations entering the human population this generation alone. And yes, they have rescue devices. That's how they know that it is a real problem. Population geneticists know that it's a real problem. That's why they've come up with rescue mechanisms such as synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism, but they've all been falsified. And the reason why is because low impact mutations, these near neutral low impact deleterious mutations, they continuously accumulate and there is a huge selection election threshold. We see it in human populations. We see it in ancient human species. We see that a lot of these so-called human evolutionary ancestors, such as Hobbit, Homo erectus, the Neanderthal, certain Neanderthal populations were seen to actually be 40% less fit than modern man today, including Homo naledi. A lot of these ancient species, what they what they suffered from was reductive evolution. That's why you see the reduction in, in brain volume and body size. And, and you see these pathologies because these isolated inbred groups, the genetic mistakes, the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes were exposed. And that led to faster, much faster genetic entropy. And inbreeding, it's a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species we see it in bacteria we see bacteria they're susceptible to reductive evolution we see lenski's e coli experiment we see that they've lost genes short term but it's long long term degeneration they've they've observed a shrinking functional genome size and there's been adaptations but they've generally been degenerative adaptations. We see it in viruses. H1N1 went from a red hot pandemic to a whimper to an extinction event in 90 years. This was the human version. Of course, this is genetic degeneration at work. Just like I said, Lenski's E. coli experiment, he's trying to prove large scale evolution. What he's actually proving is genetic degeneration and biblical creation. The beneficial mutations, and people will try and, and, and straw man me and say, oh, you know, you're saying there's no beneficial mutation. Yes, there was beneficial mutations in Lenski's bacterial experiments, but they were reductive, loss of function, loss of promoter, loss of genes. They're painting themselves into a corner. They're lazy and they're handicapped. We see genetic degeneration on all levels. I mean, we see it in cheetah populations, butterfly populations, like I said, human populations, viruses, bacteria, it is most certainly irrefutable. Just think of it this way. We have a genome of 3 billion letters. If you take out one letter, change one letter randomly, are you going to have a huge fitness effect? No, it's, it's, it's going to have a tiny fitness effect. And in reality, in fact, 
it's like rust on a car. You can't see each rusty event, but it's continuous and destructive. And he's always asking, you know, what's this loss of information? And I gave him examples where we can measure levels of homozygosity versus heterozygosity. We can, we can look at certain mutations like deletions, for example. We can look at genes that are broken. I mean, if something's broken, that indicates a loss of something. I mean, that's why it's an evolutionary tactic to avoid the clear evidence of genetic degeneration and say things like and ask questions like well what what do you mean exactly by loss of information take a book the size of an encyclopedia and you know start introducing typographical errors i mean is one single spelling mistake and have a huge huge effect no of course not but the buildup of these mistakes over time that's that's where the information loss comes from so to deny that is just to deny reality and I do like how he said that fossils are circumstantial evidence. Fossils don't prove evolution. Fossils don't mean anything as far as evolution is concerned. We don't need them. Forget fossils. They just aren't important. <laughs> also, he has a really bad idea of what radioactive decay is. Age isn't really measured, godless engineer. Rather, certain processes and amounts of materials those are what are measured and then inference is made. This age is inferred and the fact that radiometric ages for rocks of known ages actually turn out to be so vastly inaccurate and wrong is a strong, strong indication and absolute proof that one or more of the assumptions that are used in this radioisotope dating is incorrect. And secularists, what they do is they measure the amounts of the radioactive parent and the daughter isotopes in the present. Then they make a huge, massive host of unprovable, unknowable, impossible naturalistic assumptions and then extrapolate backwards in time to make what is essentially a guess about an age. It's a guessing game, just like all the storytelling you hear from evolutionists, you know. Assume uniformitarianism, which is exactly what Godless Engineer did here in the debate. The present is the key to the past, they'll say. And Think about it this way, according to our model. If God instantly created, let's say, trees, and then we analyze this, the leaves would have chlorophyll as leaves do today, but it didn't come by normal processes. I think that's obvious and evident. So when God made the first rocks, they had atoms in them. If we come along late, let's say we come along later and, and, and say that this lead must have come from decay of uranium, Therefore, we will use that to date the rock. You'd be wrong as there would be lead there to begin with. Why shouldn't there be? So at the end of the day, there's so much evidence that the earth and the universe can't be billions of years old simply based by their own dating methods. Let's use carbon-14, for example. Evolutionists assume it's always been the same radiocarbon influx. And yet the problem is the carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere. This is a fact the evolutionists even agree with. Scientific fact that as a, as a result in this atmosphere of cosmic ray bombardment of the atmosphere itself. And if you have a stronger magnetic field in the past, like we'd say, according to the biblical base model, which the evidence shows as well, it's not just ad hoc or anything like that that and the field protects from cosmic radiation then radiocarbon production would have been less in the past diamonds for example they're made up of carbon and have radiocarbon in them diamonds are formed deep inside the earth and they can't be contaminated internally or externally due to the hardness of the substance the carbon 14 has to be intrinsic to the diamonds it could not be from the atmosphere itself and i could go on and on and on i mean the evidence genetics geology, astronomy, it all points to a biblical-based model. Even when we were talking about genetics and junk DNA, and I was trying to get him to test hypotheses with me because according to the pre-existing heterozygosity model, we have predicted that the vast majority of DNA differences are functional compared to evolutionists, which will say that the, the vast majority of, of the genome is junk. They'll say 10 to 20% max is functional. And this overturning of the junk DNA era, contrary to what Godless Engineer was saying, has destroyed their very best evidence. For example, human to chimpanzee genetic identity that they used to say was 98 to 99% similar. The actual identity is now known to be 88%, probably even less. That's over 400 million DNA differences that actually exist. 
between the two species. When they sequence the these genomes, it's it's a lot of it's based on cherry pick data. The humans, for example, the human chromosome two that they say that arose through a fusion of two ape like ancestors or two ape like chromosomes, this apparent this purported fusion site is actually a functional DNA element in a human gene. So much genomic data that's actually refuting that. Because we only understand less than 5% of the DNA language based on the gold standard of functional testing, which is gene knockout tests. So the more we learn, the accumulating papers are suggesting more and more intricacy and complexity and function to this genome. They'll say humans and chimpanzees share genetic mistakes. You know, these pseudogenes, but these pseudogenes are now known to be functional DNA elements and not actually mistakes. I mean, you can look at Dr. Vanim of BioLogos. He's probably one of their best proponents. And he used to always say that humans possess the broken remnants of an ancient chicken gene. But the further and the more we know about the DNA language, we now know that no such remnant actually exists because what it is. This supposed fragment, it's, it's, a, it's a functional DNA element. Junk DNA, it's been overturned. Just like vestigial organs have been overturned. The more we learn, the less ignorant we become, the more evolutionism is refuted. I like how he doesn't consider us apes in general, which later on in the debate, he talked about how the genetics show that we're not related to chimpanzees or chimps or we're not copied from them or something. Uh, I guess it's because we look different or something like that. <laughs> It's often said that we humans share 50% of our DNA with bananas, 80% with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. Taken literally, those numbers make it sound like we could pluck one cell from a chimp and one from a human, pull out the tangled bundles of DNA known as chromosomes, unroll each one like a scroll, and read off two nearly identical strings of letters. But in reality, the human and chimp scrolls don't sync up so easily. Other large mutations revised huge sections of text, duplicating a chunk of human DNA here, erasing a chunk of chimp DNA there, while throughout the scrolls, tiny mutations swapped one letter for another. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. And there's another problem. Just as a small tweak in a sentence can alter its meaning entirely, or not at all, a few mutations in DNA sometimes produce big changes in a creature's looks or behavior, whereas other times, lots of mutations make very little difference. So just counting up the number of genetic changes doesn't really tell us that much about how similar or different two creatures are. His primary evidence was for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> We're past the whole, you know, God did it. I mean, do you believe that there would be any types of limits to that? Like whether it's genomic, physical limits, like, do you believe, let's say, uh, let's say, do you believe you can get a dog, say, ever as big as, say, an elephant or a whale? We know there's animals that exist that are as big as, say, elephants and whales, like elephants and whales, or even a dog as small as, say, a flea. We know there's insects that exist that are as small as a flea, like a flea. So do you believe there's any type of limits to the change?